Welcome everyone um, to DIY Science Day. Um, my name is Miriam. I'm a content producer for the Geek Girl Con Twitch team, and I am wearing glasses, a purplish hijab, and a black and a white jacket. Today I have here a guest starring Tori. Um, Tori, would you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Tori Stenmark. I use she, her pronouns. I am associate faculty in the chemistry department at Shoreline Community College. And I'm also the assistant for the DIY science zone here at Geek Girl Con. I am coming to you live from my kitchen uh, where I am uh, wearing a, a white lab coat over jeans and a t-shirt so that you know that I'm ready to do some science. I'm very oh. excited about it, too. Um, so I'll start us off with our icebreaker question. Um, so the question for today is, is there any scientific fact that you would like to know more about? Now, it could be a fact that there hasn't been a lot of research done on or there's a lot of unknown things. Um, do you want to go first, Tori? I mean, it's so hard to narrow all of this down, right? Um, so there's a, a, a gal I follow on Twitter um, who is currently doing what she calls Squid Timber, um, which is Squid Facts for September. Um, and she's been sharing some really cool ones. And even despite, like, we don't, one, one of the things I learned is that we don't know how big giant squid are. Like, we know they exist, but we've never actually found one to know for sure how big they are. We sort of know how big they are from, like, context clues, um, which I think like they're probably somewhere around um, 1,500 pounds, which is very yeah. big, uh, but we don't know for sure because we can't find them, which is really cool. Um, and so I would love to, you know, know how big are they for real? Can we ever actually find one of these things? Or are they just sort of, you know, one degree above Bigfoot and <laughs> that we know for sure they're real, but we can't find them. <laughs> so. Like I am, for the record, um, sorry, for the record, I am monitoring the ch chat on my phone. I'm not ignoring y'all. It's just like streaming is streaming is like that. So um, I'm not ignoring you if I check my phone. <laughs> What's your fact, Miriam? Um, mine, I feel like I like how yours was about like the ocean and like the unknown in the ocean. Mine is like unknown in space. I think I've always been fascinated by astronomy. And the like, I have a difficult time understanding um, things like dark matter and antimatter and all of that. But I think one question that really bugs me is if the universe is expanding, what are we expanding into? We have a lot of theories, but we just don't know what we're like, what are we expanding into? Where is that space coming from? Is it really space? So, yeah. Who was I watching? I watched a few different astrophysics YouTube channels and there was a gal on one of them who was talking a little bit about that. And it's sort of a thing of like, yeah, we're not entirely sure what it is. Like we think, yeah, we have we have theories. And I think one of the leading theories is that there there isn't anything that we're expanding into. We're just expanding apart from other things within the universe, Um, I think. <laughs> Yeah, and it really opens up like the question about um, different dimensions and different universes and it's like space and time continuum. And so it really drives me into a doozy and it like leaves like leads me into this like rabbit hole of like a lot of question, unanswered questions. Like, there are theories and like theories are technically answering the question, but it's still theoretical and we can't prove it in any way. There's a point at which you start to ask the questions you can't answer. And of course that gets like, it stops being a scientific question and becomes a philosophical question at that point. Because the whole point of science is you ask a question that can be answered. Maybe you can't answer it today, but you can come up with an experiment to answer the question. Like if it's not a testable hypothesis, you're just spitballing, which is fine. But like science is very specific about how these things function. <laughs> Oh, exactly. So, yeah. Um, it looks like a 
says that you would like to learn more about jellyfish too. So that's along the lines of like water and like the ocean and unknown. It's funny how we like know less about the ocean than we do about space, like relative space. Yeah. Um, and like, honestly, the ocean is just as hostile an environment as space is. It's just as hard to survive in the ocean. Um, it's, you know, excessive pressure instead of not enough pressure, but you have some of the same kinds of problems and, and stuff. So, yeah. Yeah. Let's see. Somebody is recommending a movie called Mr. Nobody. Uh, I am not familiar with that, but I will check out. Yeah. Yeah, so um waiting for anyone to learn more about. Um, but Tori, do you want to talk a little bit more about DIY Science Zone and um, what to expect for the upcoming con? And a little like tell the audience a little bit more about yourself and what you do. So the DIY Science Zone, I, I am here to represent the Science Zone, but it is not my Science Zone by a long shot. The DIY Science Zone was the uh, invention of uh, Dr. Rachel Burks, um, who is the manager of it. Um, she is in, uh, she's over on the East Coast, which is why she's not here with us live, because it's much too late for her uh, over there. Um, but so she had this idea of, so a lot of cons have hands-on gaming, right? You go and you sit down and you play a game. A lot of them are tabletop games. Some of them have video games, depending on the type of con. GeekoCon has both. Um, and so she was kind of thinking about that and thinking, okay, well, sure, that's great, hands-on gaming. But what if we had hands-on science? What if people could come to a con and do some science and, like, actually learn stuff? Um, and so... I think this is our ninth-ish year. I don't remember for sure how many years. Um, it wasn't at the very first Geek Girl Con. So we're, the Science Zone is a few years younger than the con itself. Um, but the Science Zone sort of started with just hands-on activity. So um, we used to be kind of tucked away in a corner underneath one of the um, uh, escalators in the third floor of the convention center. Um, and we'd sort of, you know, tape down some uh, tablecloths on the floor and put some plastic over some tables and chairs and have people do experiments. Um, it's all ages. It's very, very popular with kids, but it's not kids only. Like we always get adults who are like, can I try? It's like, yes, of course. It's for everyone. Come, come science with us. Um, and so everyone, uh, pretty much everyone who staffs it is some kind of scientist. We get science educators. We get scientists. Um, this year, we're going to have people from NASA coming um, to talk about, uh, I was told it will probably include Mars. Um, the NASA folks often can't tell us what they're going to tell us until like they get there. Uh, but something with Mars. Um, we're going to have the bug chicks, who are a couple of gals from Portland who have bugs, all kinds of really cool insects that you can see um, and sometimes even touch. So um, tarantulas and millipedes and centipedes and um, grasshoppers and just all kinds of things. Like I said, some of them you can gently touch. Some of them you cannot because they're fragile and they get stressed being around that many humans. Um, but you can come look at them. They've got, I think, microscopes set up so you can look closely at some of them. Um, they're really, really cool. So they'll be there. Um, Dr. Ray is going to do some cool experiments on um, uh, light glow sticks and fluorescent light and stuff like that and different dyes. Um, I'm going to do an experiment with um, Alka-Seltzer rockets, uh, which is where you take a film canister. If you remember what those are, you should, you know, <laughs> you're old like me. Um, I was going to come up with some sort of pithy thing about, you know, you should go check your car insurance or whatever. but. Um, you take a film canister, you put half an Alka-Seltzer tablet and a little bit of water in there, and you seal the lid on and turn it upside down so that as the Alka-Seltzer fizzes, it builds up gas inside that canister until the gas pressure exceeds the ability of the lid to stay on the canister and it goes and, and flies up. Um, so you get to build little rockets, which is pretty fun. Um, 
Yeah, so that's, and we're, we're gonna have some other experiments. Those are just the ones I'm, I'm telling you now. We gotta keep some secrets. We gotta keep you, you know, excited to make sure you do come and visit. Um, but in past years, um, we've done uh, slime is always very popular. We've done um, extract DNA from like peas or strawberries, other kinds of plants. Um, we've built comets. We've built model solar systems and constellations. We've done extractions of colored pigments from different kinds of candy. Um, we looked at seismic waves. Um, we looked at probability and randomness. Um, some of the NASA, NASA isn't just space, it's also earth science. Um, so they brought in this really cool model of um, glaciers. So you could actually like pour a, a simulated glacier down a slope. And so it would sort of flow down and you could see how these things move and stuff like that. Um, we've had the Pacific Science Center come bring some really fun activities. It, uh, it's different every year. Um, so that is always really, really fun. Um, and one of the things that's great about the science experiments is, yeah, is just how accessible it is and how anyone and everyone can do it. Um, let's see. Chad is excited about bugs. Good. They should be excited about bugs and space and rockets. Um, Janae was excited about the DNA extraction experiment. Yeah, that one's great because you can take it home with you. You can do a little Ziploc baggie of, of DNA and it kind of looks like these long, I mean, it's strands. It's literally, you take your DNA that, you know, it's, it's all that coiled up in that helix and it coils up in little tiny balls inside cells, but you extract it out. So you actually get long strands of it and you just take it home in your little test tube or baggie or whatever, which is kind of cool. Um, one of my favorite science zone members, I have a ton. I could, I could go on for like an hour. Um, one of my favorite science zone memories is um, I was doing luminol one year, which is the active chemical in glow sticks, or one of the active chemicals in glow sticks. Anyway, they, they can change depending on the, the brand of the type. Um, but it's, um, so, so what I was doing is I had a little dark plastic bottle, like it was, I think I would wrap the whole thing in gaff tape, so it was black, so no light could get into it. Um, and you, you'd mix the chemicals in there and you'd shake it up and then it would, you'd look into it and it would glow. Um, and so people were loving it. And this little girl, she's like two or three, honestly. Her dad's carrying her and she's small and she's kind of tired. It's late in the day and she's clearly, um, so dad asks her, hey, do you want to do some science? And she kind of, you know, tucks her face in his shoulder a little bit and it's kind of like, no, no, no. And dad goes, well, I want to do some science. So he sits down and he puts her on his lap so she can watch. And so I have dad help, you know, mix the things. Um, and uh, and I think I think once dad started to get into it, she got into it a little bit, too. Um, so I, you know, sort of you know, hand her the the, the um, teaspoon, but keep my hand on it. Right. Like you do with very tiny children. So like you're really pouring it, but they get to feel like they're doing it. Um, and they mix and they shake them and I, I hand it to her. So glass here thing. Right. I hand it to her. And she looks down into it and she comes up and her jaw, her lower jaw doesn't move. She's that excited. <laughs> it's just like, ah, because it started glowing. Like, you know, she knows that things don't normally glow. Um, but she was just so starstruck by that. And so even though she didn't want to, didn't want to do science before then, like that blew her mind. Now she's like two, maybe two or three. She probably doesn't remember that specifically. But what I hope that she took away from it is science equals wow factor. Like that's all I want is, oh, this is cool. And it's science. Um, and, you know, maybe, you know, maybe she'll come back in, you know, several years later. Um, and, and, you know, she'll remember the next set of experiments she does. But just that, that, that just, Oh, expression on her face was magic. Yeah. Wow, that, that's an amazing story, Tori. And I love how the DIY science started from like a little corner and has expanded into inviting guests from NASA and like kind of covering all different spectrums of science, what is considered science. And science sure. isn't very limited to just math or chemistry or biology. It is a huge, huge umbrella of like different things that you study like and you can literally turn anything into a science experiment it's really cool and this is what like i feel like is what diy science zone has been doing 
or we try um, anyway. I, I can't remember. Have you ever been to the Science Zone, Miriam, or not yet? I I took a glance at it, um, but I also the last one that I did attend was before COVID, so it's been a while. I didn't really get to take part in any of the experiments, but um, I've always been a big fan of science, and I've always done a lot of like my extracurriculars in school have always revolved around science as well. Um, whether it came to like mentoring um, high school students or even elementary students, um, I kind of relate to that story about the three-year-old and like that wow factor. I actually did um, the pendulum experiment with a bunch of fifth graders and um, they were very, very excited to swing um, a ball wrapped around with like a string back and forth. And I was very surprised to see how smart they were and that they were able to calculate did and calculate the time and like oh it, like the shorter length changes like how fast it swings and like the weight of the ball changes how fast it swings um and that i feel like their fascination and watching them being fascinated by science is like a great reminder of why i chose to pursue things in science later on as like in high school and in undergrad and so yeah it's it's a great, I feel like it's a great thing that you're doing and it's a very novel, but cool idea. Yeah. Um, and Geek Girl Con is not the only con. We've got an actual experiment here, but I'm going to take a couple minutes to, to plug my other favorite science communication event, um, which I just got back from, which is Dragon Con. Um, Dragon Con is a massive convention in Atlanta, but my, my part, I mean, this is um, like, 80,000 people in a pre-COVID year was not uncommon for Dragon Con. Um, but my little pocket of it is um, the science track run by uh, Dr. Stephen Grenade, who is a dear friend and uh, has actually come to Geek Girl Con a few times. I met him at Geek Girl Con um, and then kind of got invited to come play at Dragon Con. Um, and he curates this incredible set of panels and presentations and scientists to talk not just about science, but about you know, scientists as people um, to do science of cosplay. Um, and he actually kind of borrowed, uh, they call it the hands-on power hour um, because it doesn't last the entire con. It's like a two and a half hour block one day, uh, but it's the same kind of hands-on science activities like the DIY Science Zone um, where you get to come in and, and you know, again, whatever, whatever hands-on experiments you wanna deal with, um, so that was really, really fun. Um, but it was a great time to get to do that. And I think more fandom cons should have more science content. Um, Norwest Con here in Seattle has a little bit of, of science content, um, but not a ton. Um, and, and have yet to do the hands-on activities stuff. So I would love to see more of that. Um, that being said, if I say I want to see more of it, that means I have to do it. And like, it is exhausting. <laughs> like, I love hands-on science days, but uh, I get done and I'm like, okay, can I just fall over dead now? What do you mean I have to do it again tomorrow? <laughs> so, yeah. <sighs> uh, should we do some science? Yeah. Let's go on science now, now that we've talked quite about it. <laughs> All right. So, um, if, uh, if the voice in my ear would do me the favor of sharing the link I previously sent her, um, what we're gonna do today is um, an acid base indicator made out of red cabbage juice. Um, so this is something we've done at the zone in years past. I, we're probably not gonna have it this year, um, but it's a good one to do at home. It's very safe um, because all you need to do is stuff from your kitchen. So, um, what you do, this this was something we, we both, uh, Mariam and I both pre-prepped this, um, which is you chop up some red cabbage juice or some red cabbage and you put it in a pot with a bunch of water and you boil it and you steep out all of the color or most of it. Um, so you can see Mariam's on screen came out a much lighter color. There we go. And mine is much, much darker as these things go here. Um, it's possible mine is too concentrated and I'll need to dilute it, which is why I packed a flask of distilled water. 
Um, yes, I have a surprising amount of lab glassware in my home kitchen. I am a scientist. <clears throat> Um, these things just kind of happen and not all of them are my, not all of them are my fault. Many of them are, some of them are my roommate's faults. Um, <laughs> so, um, but you get this extracted. And so right now it's this beautiful sort of dark purple color or, or sort of a, a rich lavender color. Um, but it contains a chemical called anthocyanin. And, um, if you look at the link, um, that the Yeet No Khan account has helpfully shared, um, as the acidity or basicity of the solution changes, the color changes. So what we're gonna do is put this in clear glasses, add compounds of different pHs or of unknown pH and see what color change we get. Um, so you can't follow along at home unless you have this pre-prepped, but you can totally come back, watch the video later or follow the instructions uh, at that link later and try it yourself at home. Um, it's just that you do have to, you know, pre have, you have to have red cabbage, which I don't uh, on hand. You can also do the, the, this with roses, like ro red rose petals. Um, and you can probably do it with almost any fruit that's got that kind of red purple color. Um, blackberries, uh, lots of those kinds of, you know, Marion berries, boysenberries, that kind of thing. Um, Red onions would probably do it. Red cabbage works well because it's very concentrated. There's a lot of it there. Um, whereas some other things, you know, red onions aren't usually as dark as red cabbage, depending on, you know, growing conditions, whatever. Um, but so red cabbage works really well. Try other things. I will never tell you not to experiment unless what I'm telling you is, but that will kill you. <laughs> so but as long as you're safe about it, go for it. Don't extract poisonous plants. I'll tell you that one. All right, so let's see here. Helpful advice when you're pouring liquid. Um, so this one has, the, the label is on one side of this bottle. Put your palm against the label and then pour out of the other side. Um, I have been talking long enough or I'd tell you the details, but trust me, just do that. It's much better that way. All right. Now you don't need a whole lot of stuff here. I'm gonna go ahead and pour out a couple small test tubes worth. But honestly, that's probably more than I really needed. All right, so you're gonna add your whatever it is and you're gonna see what color it changes. This purple blue color is generally the color of it being neutral, more or less. Um, this is basic with this color, so it's probably not right at pH seven. Where did I put that? And in fact, I'm gonna go ahead and check that. So what I've got here, as I do the beauty blogger thing, uh, is a piece of orange uh, pH test paper from VWR Scientific. And so what I'm gonna do here, get a little, I've got a glass stir rod, it came with this cocktail set, um, get a little bit of my pH indicator solution on the glass, and then put it on the paper to see what color it changes. Yeah, that's pretty much not changing much, which is generally an indicator that it is um, pH neutral. So um, yeah, cool, good times. Uh, so I wanna go ahead and start with compounds of known pH, just so we can set up basically a control set um, so that we've got a, you know, sort of the, the far ends of the range and then we can try experimenting in the middle. Um, so the first thing I have is distilled white vinegar. I'm going to go ahead. So the real reason I'm wearing a lab coat, there are many reasons one should wear a lab coat. Uh, protection is one of them um, because they're full of pockets. 
is the main one, honestly. Right now I have my uh, lipstick and my headphone case in this pocket. My work, this is my, this is my fashion lab coat. My work lab coat is constantly full of extra hair ties, pens, pencils, clips, um, pipettes, uh, gloves. Um, but the other good reason in this case is that it's a white background. So that when I hold up my stuff, you can see the color change a little bit better. So let's try it with a little bit of vinegar first. There we go. Expected pH of white vinegar is. So this is going to be um, acidic. Um, the general pH here, it's probably going to hit like two or three. Um, a lot of it depends on the concentration, like of you know when you mix it with this solution. Um, but I'm expecting it to go a pretty pink kind of color. Boom. Oh, wow, that was immediate. Yep. There we go. So here's the untouched, and then there's the pink next to it with the vinegar here. I forgot that I should label all of my equipment so that I remember what is in it. Uh, it turns out you can just write right on a piece of glassware. Uh, I should back that with white again with Sharpies. And then it will come right off with a little bit of um, acetone, which you always have in a chem lab. Um, and here it's nail polish remover. Honestly, soap and water will usually scrub it off. So I'll take it back off before I put this away tonight because I have to do dishes. But OK, did you want to try? You had some acid, too, right? You want to try your acid? Sure, I will have to pull out my acid right here. I have lemon juice and I have vinegar, so I will go for the vinegar one first. Yeah. I wouldn't call this very. Hey, nice. I love it. That's gorgeous. You got a great set of colors there. I only boiled my cabbage for like five minutes. So I was like, oh my gosh, did I overboil it? So. I usually, what I did is I put the cabbage in with the water, brought it to a boil, boiled it for one minute, and then turned off the heat and let it sit for probably like 20, 25 minutes. I, I set a timer for like 15 minutes and then was like, I don't wanna go back downstairs yet. I'll deal with it in a minute. So it, it overran a little bit, uh, but there's no failure mode there. You can just extract as much as you need to. Right. Well, if we've established acid goes a really nice pink, let's take a look at, uh, I have baking powder here. Um, this is a uh, clabber girl, everyone's favorite. It contains cornstarch, sodium bicarbonate, sodium aluminum sulfate, monocalcium phosphate. All of these things are bases. Um, they are things that when mixed with a little bit of acid will produce carbon dioxide gas. So they bubble and fizz. This is the baking soda vinegar volcano reaction. Um, baking powder has a couple different react uh, bases in it. It's more, it's got different kinds of bases. Um, they react, um, soda reacts faster. Baking powder is a little slower to react. Um, that's why, sorry, you tripped over my kitchen nerd. Uh, my kitchen chemistry nerd for a moment here. Um, double acting, so it says double acting baking powder, which means that it gives off gas when you mix it in the bowl and it gives off a different batch of gas in the oven when you heat it. So you get bubbles as you're mixing and then you get more bubbles as you're baking it. And so together you get a sort of a double, double action. Um, the whole baked muffin or cookie or bread or whatever it is, is lighter that way. Let's go ahead. I have my 
teaspoons here. Go ahead and just add a little bit of the solid. I'm not gonna add a whole lot. This is probably about a 30 second of a teaspoon. I've got my eighth teaspoon and I just put a tiny little bit in there. And what I'm expecting here is this should go a darker blue probably. Well, let's see. It's gone cloudy, which is part of what happens when you add this powder. The cornstarch is probably not doing us any favors here. Oh, there we go. It just took a moment to, to get the everything to disperse and dissolve. But now we've got a nice blue color. And if I compare that with the original, there we go. Um, you can see that this is the original is much more purple and the mixed one here has gone more blue. So this is more basic, uh, which again is as expected. Um, and so it's always sort of nice to set up your control, what you think it should be. Baking pow. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and do mine. So yes, my baking powder is a little cloudy. I think I might have put too much. But, so you oh, pre-dissolved um, that, right? You you mixed them in advance? Yeah. So nice. Hopefully it doesn't become too cloudy when I add in the indicator. But um, and I'm going to... Ooh, it turned to like darker. Nice, definitely a different color. I like it. For labels, I have little letters on mine, so. See, that works too. All right. So Apocalyssa has an excellent question in chat, which is, if you add acid to the baking powder solution, will it change back to purple? This sounds like I cannot think of a better thing to try as an experiment. Should we try right. it with the pH indicator first? Oh, you want to check and see what pH these things are with the testers? Sure. Mm -hmm. I wish I'd been able to figure out a good way of doing a dual camera setup for this here because it's hard for it's hard to, to see it, but we'll do our we'll do our best. All right. So let's try with our vinegar solution. What I'm gonna do here is just kind of tilt this up and get this a little bit wet. And you can definitely see that it's getting pink, right? So the acid base on the pH paper, the colors aren't the greatest in my kitchen, unfortunately, but it's definitely a pink reddish color, which is again, what you expect from acid. If you test it with the baking powder solution, it's kind of a greenish color. So acid on the top, um, pH uh, base on the bottom. It's kind of a greenish color because it's not the strongest of bases. Um, I do have, did I bring down? No, I didn't bring down any drain cleaner. Um, but I do think we can find some cleaning agents that are a little more basic that might go stronger. Um, yeah, but Alyssa wanted to know if you add acid to the baking powder solution, can it turn back to purple? So I love this question. It's a very good one. I do not want to stick a pipette into my bottle of vinegar because I intend to keep cooking with this bottle. So rather than do that, you never stick a pipette directly in your reagent bottle. I'm gonna splash a little bit of it in a glass so that now when I pipette out of here, I'm not worried about contamination. All right, so there we go. So I put one drop in. I'm not sure how well it's gonna come across, but I can already see a difference. It's already going back more purple. I'm going to put a few more in to make it more obvious. 
there we go. It's definitely shading much more purple. It is thinking about, it's also fizzing, which does not surprise me. Like part of it is because I'm shaking it, um, but it's also fizzing a little bit because I've set up a small volcano reaction. Uh, but you can kind of see already the colors changing. As I add more vinegar, it gets pinker and pinker as I've changed the pH. So yeah, you can, and if I wanted to put more base in it, I could go back the other way. Like the indicator reaction is completely reversible, um, which is pretty cool, honestly. So I can just keep going back and forth um, until I run out of stuff. Now that being said, don't just randomly mix things willy nilly, particularly if you're doing anything that involves cleaning products. Because a lot of household, particularly bathroom cleaning products include bleach and a lot of other cleaning products include ammonia. And if you mix bleach and ammonia, you generate chlorine gas, which is very toxic. So in this case, I know baking powder and vinegar are perfectly fine to mix. So I was, I was happy to do that. But if you don't know for sure it's fine, don't try it. Just, just test from fresh. Um, because it turns out I don't want anyone to poison themselves on my watch. Uh, let's see. Yeah, so that's our sort of, well, now I've, now I've acidified that one too much. Um, but we've got kind of a reference of, you know, purple, you know, pink to purple to blue. Um, did you have other stuff you wanted to try? Because now I kind of feel like we can get into the stuff we're not sure about just to see what's going to happen. I really want to try the um, Sprite. Go for it. I will find it. Okay. Ooh, I don't see my right here. Um, well, if you need to go to your kitchen or whatever to find more of it, um, let's see. I can I can take a look at some other stuff here just to just to see what we've got. Um, if you want. Oh, um, I'm pretty sure it's in here somewhere. It's just having multiple potatoes and it's still which one? Surprise. Oh, yeah, I found it. Good. Want to go first? Uh, no, go ahead. I was just killing time while you found it, but you found it, so we're good. Okay, cool. So. Here is my sample of Sprite and Mary Peter. Cap, please. There we go. Oh, it looks like it's turning to pink. I don't spill anything. Not this. And there it is. And there's bright turn pink. Yeah, that'd be nice. That. There are a couple different factors um, that can cause that that can be involved in in that. So most sodas are acidic, um, and uh, part of it is. I just like the color change. 
Very, no, it's, very pink and purple. It's fun to see the whole range of, of stuff that we've got going on there, yeah. Yeah. So the next thing I want to try, which I'll be I'll be curious about, um, is I have some uh, two in one shampoo and conditioner. A lot of times you'll find hair products that'll say you know pH balanced or whatever. Um, this one does not. Um, so I'm kind of I'm kind of curious. Um, it does as I'm looking at the ingredient list. Um, I see some things that I predict will be basic, but I also see like citric acid, which is obviously acidic. Um, but the, next to it is sodium benzoate, which is a base. So my guess is it'll probably be pretty close to neutral. Um, I think it might, let's see. I think it'll skew a little basic just because of the things I'm seeing in here. I'm seeing more things that are basic than things that are acidic. But it depends on the ratio of stuff that's in there. So I put some in a in a glass this time to make it a little easier to see. And I'm just gonna squirt a little bit in there. And then I need to make sure it dissolves so that we can actually see, you know, what's going on. So I've got a stir rod. Well, it doesn't smell the greatest when mixed with cabbage juice, I'll tell you that much. I'm not seeing a substantial color change, honestly. Um, I'm seeing some bubbles because it's a soap solution and I stirred it, but I'm not seeing a big color change. So my guess is that the, the pH, that the conditioner actually is pH balanced. Um, even if it doesn't say so, it is still pretty close to a neutral pH. Um, so that's cool. Now I know. Um, okay. They don't need to say it's pH balance. They can always refer back to our stream. Exactly. I tested <laughs> by Geek Girl Con. Science. <laughs> um. I could get into marketing wank about how I think that's probably like why I think it doesn't say that, but that's not really what we're dealing with here. Um, so, yeah. Um, did you have another sample you want to try? Um, I want to try something more acidic this time. I'm going to go for lemon juice. Cool. I don't know which one it is this So here, actually, this is why not lemon, but I have some pure lime juice right here, freshly squeezed about two hours ago. Nice. Um, and then I will grab some of the indicator. And then I am. My proportions are not very scientific. <laughs> and here we have it. So more like a very bright pink, almost on the orange-ish um, color spectrum, but as expected because Lime has citric acid, and citric acid is acidic. So, and here's my vinegar to compare. Nice. And the part of that, like the lime juice you started with, was a little cloudy looking. Part of it is just like the color of the original sample affects the color of the final mixture. Um, so sometimes you end up kind of having to dilute it if you're trying to test like a really colorful sample. Um, you dilute it a little bit to see how it affects the, the solution without being like, okay, but like I'm testing the pH of like if I'd used like Coke, since you know you use Sprite, which is colorless, but if you'd used Coke, you might be like, okay, like Coke is brown, so what color is the indicator changing? Um, 
So sometimes like in that case, you know, maybe you have a suit lamp of indicator and you add a little bit of your Coke, small drops to the, of the Coke to see if that'll change the color rather than trying to fight. Is it brown? Is it purple with brown mixed into it? What color is it? Smart. I will keep that in mind for next time when I have some other things I want to try out at home. Uh, let's see. So here's one I definitely want to make sure to try, um, which is Windex. Now, Windex uh, is a spray cleaner, right, for glass. And I couldn't actually, let's see if it actually has the ingredients listed on here. Um, hey, they are there. They have helpfully listed the ingredients. So you have to look through the liquid to try and read them. I don't understand why somebody thought this was a good idea. Um, but it contains some solvents, but it contains amines. It contains amino propan, one amino propan to all. Um, so this is a variation on ammonia. Sometimes they just use straight up ammonia. This one is a little less um, volatile, but ammonia and, and its cousins are very strong bases. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna take an open, I don't wanna use one of my test tubes for reasons you'll discover momentarily. Um, I'm gonna take an open topped glass. Pour in a reasonable chunk. I have lots more indicator, which I may need in a minute here. Pour this in, and then I'm just gonna spray the Windex straight into the glass. Let's see if we can get that set up so you can see it more clearly here. So we've got this nice purple blue color. Oh wow. Right? Blue. Dark blue. It goes basically green. So if I hold that, let's see. There we go. Yeah, so it goes a much greener teal color here um, because it's more basic than the baking soda or baking powder is, um, which is kind of cool. So <laughs> I have another good story about all of this stuff here. Um, which is there was one time when, um, so when I was a kid, you know, we pretty much always had dinner together as a family. Um, mom did a lot of the cooking, but dad also cooks. Um, so they kind of divvied it up depending on who was home that night. Um, and mom had left in instructions for cabbage soup, um, which we'd made, like I helped. This was in high school. I think she was at some kind of, of was a PTA meeting or a work meeting or something like that. She was, she was out, out, out late. So she came back late, like during dinner. So she'd given dad and I instructions to make this potato cabbage soup. And I don't remember if we had both white you know green and red cabbage or if we'd gone grocery shopping and the list had just said cabbage and we'd picked out red but we'd made the soup with red cabbage and it turned out because of whatever else was in it i don't remember the recipe i'm sorry i'd have to look it up that it came out kind of this terrible bluish gray color because <laughs> it was basic and the red cabbage that we put in there for flavor had extracted the, you know was also a ph indicator like you can't make it not be a ph indicator whether whatever you it's just going to do that so we'd made soup that was a little bit basic and it uh, it looked kind of lowish gray. It tasted great. So dad and I ate it happily, but mom comes home, looks at dinner, is like, that's kind of unappetizing looking. I'm like, no, 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 mom, it's fine. It does the chemistry thing and explains. Um, and I'm like, well, like we could make it pink if you wanted. And she goes, that sounds better. How do we do that? <laughs> so we put... I think apple cider vinegar, which is kind of what I would, would mix in at that point, or maybe just regular vinegar. Like, well, you could use lemon juice, but that wouldn't taste good. Um, so we went with a little apple cider vinegar and sure enough, the soup went pink and she's like, that's much better. And she ate it just fine, um, which was kind of funny. But um, we got done with dinner and, and there was, you know, like a little like trace bits of liquid left in the bottom of the goblet that we were eating out, of, right? Um, so I'm like, let's have some fun with this. And so I pull out the Windex spray bottle and I start spraying Windex into my goblet of leftover soup traces. And sure enough, it went green just like this one did. Like, this is great. It was not great. I mean, it was fun. 
it was not food. It was obviously as soon as you add Windex, it's not food anymore. But it was only trace amounts. It's not like I was actually wasting any real soup or anything. Um, but yeah, so that's that's how I knew uh, to try Windex is adventures with high school age Tory and shenanigans. Um, my father is also a sciencey person. Like he's a an engineer. He's got a mathematics degree and he used to do surveying. Um, and my mother is an artist. Like she's a very accomplished watercolor painter. Um, and so every now and then I, of course, went STEM. And so every now and then she's just kind of like, what are you, why are you like this? Why do I have to deal with this? And I'm like, look, you picked my dad. You knew this was a possibility. Don't blame me. And I didn't pick dad, you did. So really this is your fault. Um, they get along great. I love my parents. We're, we're totally cool, but we do occasionally, you know, joke about it a little bit. So. I love, uh, let's see. I love that red Do we have any last story. one last set of tests? Right? Um, Do we have one last set of tests? I I have rubbing alcohol. I know the outcome, but um should I just try it out for the sake of trying it out? Absolutely. Give it a shot and we'll see what happens. Okay. I'm using my sense of smell to make sure I have the right one. Right you. <laughs> All right, so I have rubbing alcohol and could have done it the other way around, but oh well. Still purple, so rubbing alcohol neutral. Probably, most likely, close to seven is what I want to say. Yep. Yep. Um, and as you see, the color's lighter because it got diluted, not because it's actually, but they didn't change the color. It just diluted it, um, which is something to watch for occasionally. It's like, well, it did change, but it changed because you poured more liquid into it, not because it's different. All right. I should have done so it the also... other way around, like you suggested. Mm -hmm. That would have been better. Yeah. Um, so I've got one more thing I want to test, which will actually demonstrate a different methodology of, of trying this. So when I made my um, extract, I filtered it through a coffee filter. So I just had a big wide mouth funnel in a jar um, and I just sort of poured stuff through a coffee filter. And once I was done with that, I saved the coffee filter and let it dry and cut it into strips. And you can see perhaps, that the strips are a nice light purple color because they're saturated with the same anthocyanin. So I've made my own set of pH test strips here. Um, and you can do that on purpose too. Just, you know, dunk the pieces of paper in your cabbage juice and then just let them air dry. So you get them nice and saturated. Coffee um, filters are great for this because they're meant to be really durable when they're wet, right? A lot of... Um, paper falls apart when you get it wet, but coffee filters are meant to stay strong as the hot water is dripping through them with your coffee. So they work really well for this. So what I've got is uh, denture cleanser tablets, which contain a bunch of things that are bases and then also citric acid, um, which is why it fizzes in the combination of the base and the acid. But I'm pretty sure Oh wait, no, this is these are dyed, aren't they? Yeah, that's right. These are these are oh that's right. This may not work. Um these tablets are dyed blue and then the blue fades over time. Um, but it'll actually will probably work okay on the, the paper test strip. All right. So I'm just gonna take part of my denture tablet, drop it in, drop it in with no water. That's smart. Go ahead, try crushing it a little bit. Yeah, it's definitely, the glass is a little, the liquid in the glass is a little bit blue, um, but it should be okay with the pH um, paper test strip here. So you can dunk the paper in directly or you can use a stir rod or a pipette or a spoon or whatever to get 
this wet and then drip it on the paper, which is what I'm gonna do here. Let me give it a moment. Part of it is, of course, it's wet, so it looks a little different because it's wet. But let's see here. The top one, which is the top wet one, definitely looks a little bluer to me. So it is a little bit, a, a little bit basic still. Um, it's not a ton. And again, part of that is because it has that acid in it to make it fizz. So it's sort of deliberately canceling out some of the base. Um, the bubbles are part of the cleaning mechanism. Like having bubbles helps knock loose debris and helps make sure everything mixes well and stuff like that. So that's why um, it's set up like that. Um, yeah, so you can make your own pH test paper with this. You can just use the solution. You can test uh, basically anything you want. Um, Water-based solutions work better. Um, so if it dissolves in water, that's probably going to work out better. Um, so like that's why I didn't get like olive oil from my kitchen because olive oil just doesn't mix with water. So it doesn't really have a pH. Like pH is the measurement of acidity in an aqueous solution, a water solution. And if there's no water, then it's not, you don't have any hydrogen to measure. Um, yeah. Um, if folks have uh, other questions or whatever, like I said, this is a great one to do at home. Everything that I've done can just go straight down the drain. Um, if you use like really concentrated drain cleaner or something like that to test, just rinse it with extra water um but really all of these can just go straight down the drain your leftover solution can go down the drain um i'm probably i made a whole bunch so i'm probably going to save at least a little bit of it just for the next time i feel like testing ph um i don't know if i throw a halloween party this year maybe we'll just sit around and check ph of everything as as part of the the fun of it um there's some fun magic tricks that you can do that are sort of fun science where you you know you you preload a little bit of acid or base in the bottom of a cup and then you pour a liquid in and it suddenly turns a different color and then you pour it again and so you can kind of do the like water into wine on um, as you go from a clear solution into an acidic solution um and then you make it go basic or whatever and you sort of change up your your colors a little bit um which is kind of fun Uh, just checking to see if anyone else has any more questions. We'd like to ask Tori. Oh, see any. Um, uh, I, I got a ping that somebody just subscribed. Thank you for subscribing. Thank you, um, Moxino. Yeah. Uh, and Tithonium followed earlier. Thank you, Marty. We appreciate you. Um, and yeah. Uh, let's see. Yeah, so um, I have a few more things I could test, but really it's, it's, it's all sort of on the same thing, theme here. Um, and like, again, I could have gone through my entire kitchen cabinet and cleaning cabinet, but um, you know, that's, that's pretty good. Uh, yeah, shall we, shall we go ahead and, and wrap up then? Or do you have other stuff you want to oh, talk about? We can, we can go ahead and wrap up. Um, just to let everyone know, uh, on Thursday, we are, Taryn will be playing Factoria. Um, and then on Tuesday next week, we have 3D art with, with Becca. Um, and then make sure to check those out on Thursday. There's Factoria with Taryn and then 3D art with Becca on Tuesday next week. And then just as a reminder, um, G Girl Con is back in person for their first con since COVID um, in November. Um, please come and check us out and please come and check out the DIY Science Zone and the cool, amazing exhibits that they'll have there with NASA and bugs and the little mini rockets. Um, yeah, uh, anything else? 
Yeah, we're really excited to get to be back. Um, don't forget that masks and proof of vaccination are required. Um, we would also love those new bivalent boosters that are coming out now that are protection against Omicron variants. Uh, mine is scheduled for tomorrow. Uh, I was like, mm, I should wait till after the stream just in case it knocks me on my butt. Um, but make sure uh, that's not required. But scientists, I recommend it. Um, but yeah, we're super pumped to be back in person. Uh, Dr. Ray and I were talking a little bit at Dragon Con, where we were both at, and in our prep meetings about how much fun it's going to be. Um, and, you know, like, the zone is, is it's, it's exhausting, I'm not going to lie, but it's a labor of love, and we're really excited to be able to do that for you in person. Um, we had a lot of fun with the virtual conline content we did the past couple of years, um, so make sure we have those on our uh, Geek Girl Con YouTube channel. So we have the Conline 2020 and the Conline 2021 videos, um, which are both really great. I'm particularly proud of the 21 video because, so I have a reputation <laughs> among the staff of always wanting to do explosions. And it turns out that the venue won't let me and the con won't let me because they have these things called insurance. And I'm very sad about it every time. It's just like, come on, just maybe, maybe lethal explosion, maybe lethal beats. And they're like, no, no explosions for you. Um, so, but when we were prepping for con line 21, I was like, wait, 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 wait. This is a filmed video. I can do explosions. As long as I'm safe about it, I don't have a live audience and I don't have a venue like the convention center to worry about. So what I did um, is I went to my college chemistry department. I said, hey, can I use college facilities and college hydrogen <laughs> uh, to blow stuff up? And they very graciously said yes. So um, in uh, it's a, we've got a one hour video that has several different experiments in it, but my part is actual live explosions. Um, where I filled some balloons with hydrogen and some other colored chemicals so that you get these nice explosions and then colored explosions like fireworks. Um, and I had a ton of fun getting to do that. And so um, make sure you check that out because I did get to blow stuff up. And then this year uh, we will be doing, um, like I said, the Alka-Seltzer rockets, which are much safer um, in that they're not like fire. They're just little pressure explosions um, that are fairly small. And so um, come do small safe explosions with me in person and watch the really big fireball explosions uh, online. Um, it's gonna be a blast, literally and figuratively. So, yeah, it sounds wait. super exciting and I can't wait either. Um, so let's see, I, um, I'm just gonna check in with Prime and see who we're rating tonight. Right. Uh -huh. Cool. So it sounds like we're reading Nitty Nurse tonight. Uh, think... It's just in from the voice in our ears. <laughs> you want to go ahead and do that, Tori? Uh, sure. We're, uh, I don't have any of the, the commands to do it, uh, but we're gonna we're gonna raid someone. Uh, knitting nurse, which sounds exciting. Uh, hopefully she's going to go knit things because that's always fun to watch. Uh, maybe she's playing games. I don't know. Uh, they're playing games. I don't know. So yeah. Um, thank you for coming. You've been a wonderful audience. It's always a joy to get to share my love of science with everyone. Come to con in person. Come watch Twitch next week, every Tuesday and Thursday night. So you should see what our Twitch team is doing. We're we work really hard and I get to do a very small amount of the Twitch content and everyone else does a ton of content and I am delighted to help bring it to you. Thank you, Tara. It's always a pleasure to have you and you've been really great with guiding us through Thank these you. experiments. Super exciting. Um, good night, everyone. Thank you. And I think we'll be switching out. Bye. Bye.